need to talk about Bruno, no, no, no. We need to talk about Bruno. From the boy in the striped pajamas. Yes, this reference is a bit dated. It took me a while to get to writing this video. Um, so take it or leave it. I knew we were gonna have to have this conversation eventually, but I did not think it would be under this circumstance. Earlier this year, author John Boyne announced that he was writing a sequel to The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. <laughs> Hello darkness, my old friend. All the Broken Places comes out in the fall. Rachel and I will talk about that when it comes out because clearly a book that's going to follow a daughter of a Nazi. You're dealing with grief and guilt, but not over the innocent Jewish people who were harmed and killed, but her little brother who was killed by mistake in the Holocaust. Yes, the sequel's gonna focus on Bruno's sister, Greta, because she was such a compelling character. Not like Bruno was any better, because that's not out yet, and I can't comment on more than I know. Let's talk about The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, because it's so much worse than you remember. The 2006 book by Irish author John Boyne focuses on a young boy named Bruno. Bruno is the son of an SS officer, and they move to a house right outside of Auschwitz. One day, Bruno meets a little boy named Shmuel who wears striped pajamas. Bruno thinks he and the other people wearing striped pajamas are playing a game, unaware that they're Jewish people in a concentration camp. It ends with two boys dying because... reasons? There's supposed to be some kind of moral. I don't really know what it is. Probably something about innocence and at the end of the day, you can't tell a Jewish person and a non-Jew apart. And we're all human and being mean to other humans is bad. I reread the book. Thankfully, I found a free PDF so I didn't have to buy it. John Boyne's just not a good person. <laughs> He doesn't need any more money. So on that note, here are my issues with the boy in the striped pajamas as a Jewish person. Number one, Bruno. Bruno is such an unlikable brat. He is one of the most grating characters in all of fiction. I understand he's nine years old in the book. I understand he's a kid. But this boy acts like he is four or five years old. I think this was done to emphasize his innocence, but it just comes across as unlikable. And if you want main character to act like a five-year-old, just make them five. And he spends the first half of the book just moping around, said that he and his family have moved and now he has no friends. Which, you know, okay, at nine, I get that, but John Boyne, please understand. You just waste a whole lot of time on this. It is overly long, overly boring, and it just repeats the same thing about Bruno over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. Bruno is also pretty selfish. There are a few times when he brings food over to Shmuel, which is, you know, a nice gesture, but um, there are many times when on his way from his house to the fence, Bruno eats the food. You know, this is a well-kept boy, but he just gets a little, he just gets a little peckish on his way. And then before he knows it, he has eaten most of a cake and then he eats the rest because Bruno thinks it'll be rude to bring Shmuel just, you know, a little mouthful of cake. And that's right, but like, dude, you're nine. You can definitely go five minutes without eating. Bruno is not very book smart. He's very naive and very uninterested in learning more about the world around him. And this comes off as rating and bothersome because Bruno's a nine-year-old kid, the son of an SS officer who grew up in Berlin during the rise of Hitler. You cannot tell me that not only did Bruno not know what a Jewish person was, he didn't know who Hitler was because he would have been taught to hate Jewish people in school. He would have been taught about Hitler in school. So unless 
this boy just was 100% not paying attention to anything around him, not even what his parents were talking about, was just up in his little head in La La Land. I can't buy it. Even before, like, they started getting propaganda in schools, he lived in Berlin, which is the capital of Germany. If there would have been Jews there, he almost definitely would have been in Hitler Youth. I think maybe he was, like, a year too young to be in Hitler Youth historically, but, like, he would have been looking forward to it. And in the book, he has a tutor when he moves to Auschwitz, then his tutor would have been explicitly teaching him about why Jews were terrible people because that's what a tutor to the son of an SS officer would do. Bruno's father is a high-ranking SS officer, high enough that he is able to have Hitler over his house for dinner. And you're going to tell me that Bruno doesn't even know Hitler's proper title. He calls Hitler the Fury, not the Fuhrer, the Fury, even though, you know, he's German and doesn't know or speak English. Number two, Bruno's family. His father is an SS officer. That's enough reason to hate him. His mother is shown to be a decent-ish person, except for the fact that she's having an affair with a teenage lieutenant. And, you know, she is the wife of an SS officer and She's also shown to be completely ignorant to what's really happening. When it is revealed, she seems rightfully horrified, but she does nothing to stop it. And his sister Gretel, who is going to be the main character of All the Broken Places, is a pretty typical 12-year-old girl in Nazi Germany. Unlike Bruno, and she's aware of who Hitler is, she's still shown to be innocent in a lot of ways, which is utterly ridiculous. Because she definitely would have been in the female version of Hitler Youth, whatever that was called, I'm not going to look it up. She and her mother are both depicted as innocent, giving the impression that most people didn't know what was going on, even though the Germans knew what was going on the same way we know what's going on at the border and at the concentration camps in China. But because most people don't care or they want it to happen, they approve of what's happening. The Germans knew what was happening at the concentration camps. They knew Jews were being murdered. They knew, and most of them did nothing because they wanted it to happen. They didn't care, and the few people who did do something are the good ones. But that wasn't most people. All of them, the whole family, dad, mom, sister, brother, they all would have known. People knew what was happening to the Jews during the Holocaust. Nobody wanted to do anything. It didn't happen overnight. I mean, surely you've been taught about Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when Germans destroyed many Jewish-owned shops. Those were Germans doing it, Christian Germans. It preceded the Holocaust. German people were the ones raiding Jewish businesses, vandalizing their homes, vandalizing synagogues, and driving Jewish people out of town. They knew because they were doing it. Number three, Shmuel. The boy in the striped pajamas is about 200 pages long. Shmuel appears about halfway through. He is the titular character and he does not appear till halfway through the book. He also isn't granted even a fraction of a personality. He only acts scared, confused, and hungry. The book seems torn like as to how innocent Shmuel is because he's not really aware what happened to his father even though I think Historically, he would have known his father would have been killed in the gas chambers, but the book can't have him knowing what's going on because then obviously he would not trust or talk to Bruno. Like that boy would be like, oh shit, that is a Nazi kid. Who knows what's gonna happen to me? I'm out. I don't care that he has cake. If you replace Shmuel with an animal. Basically nothing would change about the story. Shmuel is not a character. He is an object, a plot point, a potted plant, the sexy lamp trope. You can replace him with an object and basically nothing would change. He is something that exists solely to be pitied. By making him just this pitiful creature who would not be able to make it with the help of the nice little innocent white boy. In books like this, the Jews aren't a focus of their own genocide. Number four, Bruno again. I listed him again because am I really supposed to believe that the son 
of a high-ranking SS officer who grew up in Berlin during the 1940s has never heard the word Jew before. Like, he would have at least heard the word used derogatorily. I refuse to buy the base, this basic concept. Number five, out with. A lot of Bruno's innocence comes from him mishearing words, but the words you hear don't make sense for the fact that this is a boy who only speaks German. Auschwitz comes out with. Führer becomes Fury, and he thinks Hail Hitler is another way of saying good afternoon. Hail Hitler. 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 Bruno only speaks German. Why would he be hearing some of these as English words? It makes no sense, but that's not how this works. I don't speak German, but I'm pretty sure that's not how the German language works. It's ridiculous. It shows a fundamental lack of research or care. And that brings us to our next point. Number six, the historical inaccuracies. This could probably be a whole video in and of its own, but we've already discussed how there's no way Bruno or his family would be so blithely unaware of what was happening. But there are other historical inaccuracies, like Schmuel. While there were young boys at Auschwitz, most of them were part of experiments and were kept away from the general population. Most kids were killed once they arrived at the camp. Those who weren't were put to work and definitely would not have had the time to go and sit near the fence for hours at a time. And Schmuel would have been one of the kids who was killed. He's shown as small and weak, kind of sickly, so he wouldn't have been much use. No one like Shmuel would have existed. And even if he did exist and he wasn't sickly, he never would have been allowed to go anywhere near the fence. He would have been shot. Bruno probably wouldn't be able to get anywhere near the camp, just in general, unless he went with his dad. I can picture a morbid take your kid to work day where father shows off Auschwitz to Bruno, but yeah but definitely not him just wandering and being like, oh, a little boy, I am going to be make friends with him. I don't know how successful Boyne th thought the book was going to be, but he purposely made inaccurate, sentimental dribble that focuses on the emotions of a Nazi family with an ending that is heart-wrenching. And that makes me think this man knew exactly what he was doing because if you don't know about a subject, you shouldn't be writing about it. This was not an accident. He made a story where he sympathizes with Nazis. And it's very telling that nobody during this process was like, hey, maybe this is a bad idea. There's a lot of blame to go around, people. Point seven, the ending. I hate this ending. It's one of the worst endings in all of literature. I've already said this, but spoiler alert, Bruno and Shmuel die in the gas chambers. Bruno's father gets so depressed, he surrenders to the allies. And that makes everything okay. A few months after that, some other soldiers came to Alf with, and father was ordered to go with them. And he went without complaint and he was happy to do so because that he really didn't mind what they did to him anymore. His father was suicidal. Would have been better if he just shot himself. And this also implies he wouldn't have surrendered if Bruno was still alive. All the focus of the tragedy is on Bruno, a sweet, ignorant little boy who didn't know what was going on. There's none of that same sympathy for Shmuel. Shmuel somehow, even though he is also innocent, is not considered a tragic loss. It is sad because he died with his friend, not sad because he and his family died. And the absolute worst part of the ending is like the ending ending. Here are the last few sentences of the book. And that's the end of the story about Bruno and his family. Of course, all this happened a long time ago and nothing like that could ever happen again. Not in this day and age. I have no idea if this is supposed to be ironic or sincere, but it treats the Holocaust like a long forgotten, almost fictional event. Like, like, oh no, this is like the way of Cinderella and the three bears. You don't have to worry about dragons or monsters under your bed. You don't have to worry about stuff like this happening, sweetie, you know, go to bed. It's really bothersome when there are people alive today, and there were even more when this book was published, who were alive during the Holocaust, who survived the Holocaust. Like maybe tell their stories. And this last line, not in this day and age, just implies the Nazis were from a more unenlightened time and that society has greatly improved. 
I hate it. It's a load of bullshit. Considering the amount of white supremacists currently holding office throughout the world, it's certainly a take. It's, this whole book is just tragedy porn. It's really bad. Number eight, the book in general. This book is bad. This is a bad book. It's written very childishly because it's from Bruno's perspective, but again, Bruno is nine and this is written like it's from the perspective of a five-year-old. Phrases get repeated over and over again for emphasis and to show the themes and to show how Bruno really doesn't understand how the world works, so he just repeats what people tell him. And the phrases that often get repeated really don't have anything to do with the story. And then there's the fact that such a simple book is often given to middle schoolers. 12, 13 year olds. It's written like it's for a much younger audience and it treats the audience very poorly. Like 12 year olds are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They can engage with complex literature and media. These are kids who've read Percy Jackson, The Hunger Games, plenty of books where other characters are brutally murdered. They don't need to be coddled. And especially in a book where the Holocaust is treated as a fictional event, you don't need to make it so childish. There's nothing challenging or thought provoking about this book. The, the moral is utterly simplistic. Everybody is human and should be treated with respect. Also, only children are capable of seeing the good in everything. And that has all the subtlety of a hammer to the head. What was the difference? He wondered to himself. And who decided which people wore the striped pajamas and which people wore the uniforms? Wow, how deep, how thought provoking. Gag me. The whole book is focused around the most naive little nine year old to ever walk the damn planet. At least if he had been like six or seven, it wouldn't have been as bad. Like it, it still would have been horrible, but at least I can buy a six or a seven year old kind of not totally comprehending everything. I expect a nine-year-old to have a little more sense. I can't imagine him not completely getting words right, but I can't imagine him getting them in English. This book is like 200 pages long and there's maybe 50 pages of actual substance and that is being very generous. I don't get why The Boy in the Striped Pajamas is hailed as like the pinnacle of Holocaust literature. Most of it's just a Nazi boy moping around the house, sad that he's no longer in Berlin. We don't need a whole book about that. We don't need that. Number nine, the author, John Boyne. I hate this man. He seriously damaged the integrity of Holocaust education. That is, in general, a very egotistic, self-congratulating, ignorant man who happens to think he's one of the greatest authors of all time? I'm really sad that he's no longer on Twitter because I would love to see his reaction to this video. This man cannot take criticism if his life depended on it. <laughs> you would call this bullying. This is not bullying. Mostly. Boyne in general is just a terrible writer. And the boy in the striped pajamas is not his first controversy. In 2019, he wrote a book called My Brother's Name is Jessica. And it is very transphobic. I have not read this book. I will not read it. I do not have the qualifications to really talk about why. It is transphobic, but you can probably tell from the title why this is an issue. He responded to criticisms of this book by saying he doesn't consider himself a cis man. He just considers himself a man. John Boyne doesn't know what the word cis means. And while I wholeheartedly support the right of trans men and women and consider them courageous pioneers, it will probably make some unhappy to know that I reject the word cis, the term given by transgender people to the non-transgender brethren. I don't consider myself a cis man, I consider myself a man. For a while, I will happily employ any term that a person feels best defines them, whether that be transgender, non-binary, or gender fluid to name a few. I reject the notion that someone can force an unwanted term onto another. That's not how the term cis works, John. And in another book that takes place on Earth, Boyd copied and pasted a dye recipe from the internet, which happens to come from The Legend of Zelda. But his worst responses to criticism come from the people criticizing the boy in the striped pajamas. Because of course they do. He considers himself a Holocaust scholar, which is really bad considering he isn't. In one interview, he said, 
I'd been a quite serious student of Holocaust literature for many years. It had been a subject that I'd been fascinated by and had read very widely on, but I never thought I would write about it myself. This idea came into my head of these two boys at the fence talking to each other. The whole story sprang from there. All of that reading and research over the years just led me to a place where I could explore the subject in what I thought was an original way. And there's this quote from a 2006 interview which shows that he really doesn't know anything about the Holocaust because he thought they didn't know anything. The Nazis weren't exactly known for their subtlety, John. And if you were a serious student of the Holocaust, you would have known that. The interviewer says, is it realistic to think that a nine-year-old boy, especially the son of the command commandant, would be so in the dark as to what was taking place around him? How could he not know? And Boyne responded, this is perhaps the question I've been asked the most about the novel, and I feel very strongly that Bruno's innocence and ignorance are not only crucial to the story, but appropriate to the times, too. In a way, the question implies a wider question. How could so many millions of people have been murdered under the eyes of the whole world without anyone knowing about it? When the war ended and the camps were liberated, the world was shocked by what they learned. But it had been going on for years. And the whole point is that it continues to go on today in places around the world. And what do we do about it as society, as people? And also, he said, I remain immensely proud of the novel. While it has its critics, it has become for a generation of young people around the world, their first introduction to a study of the Holocaust, which holds a responsibility in itself. I have always made sure to impress on young readers the fact that this is a work of fiction, a fable, and to list the titles I would recommend they read next just as that teacher did for me. If it eh, has encouraged some of them to explore the subject further and keep those memories alive, then that for me is perhaps the novel's most significant achievement. I, I, I don't know how to explain this to you, John, but like if one of your critics of your Holocaust novel is the Auschwitz Memorial, maybe rethink everything and listen to their criticism. The museum had commented after Boyne tweeted, I can't help but feel that con by constantly using the same three words and then inserting a noun, publishers and writers are effectively building a genre that sells well, when in reality the subject matter and their titles should be treated with a little more thought and consideration. The Auschwitz Memorial responded, We understand those concerns and we already addressed inaccuracies in some books published. However, the boy in the striped pajamas should be avoided by anyone who studies or teaches about the history of the Holocaust, which good for them. I would not have been as polite. Boyne tries to defend himself by saying the book is clearly labeled as a work of fiction, but that also doesn't change the fact that he's basically using a genocide of a group that he doesn't belong to to make money and not listening to the people who the book is about criticize how they're portrayed. Let's look at Boyne's Twitter. Here's one. The best writers challenge disturb outrage. Imagine G'day, Miller, Dickinson, with an SR. No serious writer should, would ever allow their work to be so sanitized. The best books, the ones that last, have passionate defenders and critics. That's what literature is for. That doesn't mean you're free from criticism. Sensitivity readers are there to help and make sure your book challenges without being <laughs> outright offensive and incorrect. And Boyne continues to paint himself as a victim. If you feel vulnerable on Twitter, remember, when strangers attack you, call you names, or assume some insight in your, into your character, it is never about you. It is only about them and their disappointments in life. None of it matters. It's pointless to engage. Be kind and stop online bullying. Criticism about your Holocaust book from Jewish people is not bullying. Me calling you a poor writer is, not, is also not bullying. You don't get a free pass on all your criticisms from your books and your general persona just because you're gay. You don't get a free pass because you're educating people when the book you wrote in like three days with no research is literally harming the quality of education. If you just want to write a fable about the horrors of war, you literally could have just made up a fucking war. You literally could have just made something up, a fictional, tragedy without exploiting the Jewish experience for profit and frankly it would not have been as offensive. It still would have been a poorly written book but uh, at least it would not be used 
to denigrate Jewish people and the Holocaust education. Despite the fact that this book is labeled as a fable, it is most often taught as history, part of a history unit, an introduction to the Holocaust, or it's at very least believed by students to be true. And that might be the most harmful part of all. So let's talk about number 10, impact on Holocaust education. And of all the reasons why the boy in the striped pajamas is bad, perhaps the most important is the effect it had on Holocaust education, especially in the UK. This book is many children's introduction to the topic. A study found that it is the most widely read book about the Holocaust among students ages 12 to 18, which surpasses Anne Frank's diary by almost 60% and even history textbooks. In the UK, over 35% of teachers use it as a resource when teaching the Holocaust and history lessons. Like, holy crap. I don't care if your book was intended to be a fable when that's not the way it's being used. And you're standing around there like a goddamn nincompoop saying, that wasn't my intention, it's just a fable. When you're not doing anything to combat the harm that the book has done. While some students are capable of recognizing it as fiction, the parts they find realistic isn't exactly great, and they've come away with some particularly disturbing conclusions. And in this 2016 study, they found that many students drew false conclusions, such as assuming that Germans would not have known anything about the Holocaust because Bruno's families did not, or even that the Holocaust had stopped because a Nazi child had accidentally been gassed. And other students believe that Jews had volunteered to go into the camp because they had been fooled by Nazi propaganda. And again, this is students' introduction, so they learn this first and they come away with ideas from it and those ideas influence the rest of their Holocaust education. This study also reported that the story elicited profound and often misplaced sympathy for German and even Nazi families. And also the people who took part in this study recognized it as a work of fiction and were able to identify and critique its most glaring plot points, but they still characterized it as overwhelmingly truthful. Here's some lines that actual students have said. One student said, well, we always think of the Nazis as the bad guys and this shows that the Holocaust didn't just affect the Jews. Another student said, it is too easy to feel sorry for the Jews. I don't mean that in a rude way. It is just like everyone is always going to sympathize with the Jews. When you see it from like Bruno or his mother's perspective, it seems a bit different because they have to live with that. Yikes. And another one said, and this is probably the most egregious one of them all, the Nazis couldn't do anything about it because they basically got killed off if they didn't do what Hitler said. It doesn't matter who was the bigger victim. The Nazis and the Jews were all still victims of Hitler's control in some shape or form. Yikes, 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 yikes. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with any of that. Oh my God, I am not comfortable with any of that. I honestly recommend reading the study yourself. I've linked it below. The fact that these students are in year 12 calls for concern. These, these aren't 10 year olds. These aren't little kids. Not to mention, I, I have to question why this book is being taught to like 15 year olds when that's far below their reading comprehension and 15 is like really late to just be learning about the Holocaust. I'm gonna be honest, it was weird reading this book in middle school, being like one of the only Jewish people in that, in my English class, especially with this frame of reference. We read other Holocaust books, but I, I'm pretty sure we read this one first and a lot of kids were confused by certain things. I remember we were studying another book, The Devil's Arithmetic, which is written by a Jewish author, stars a Jewish main character, and there's a scene where the prisoners are ascribing meaning to their tattooed numbers. Some of the kids thought that the Nazis actually gave meaningful numbers to the people. And I had to explain, no, that's not the case. The Nazis would not have ascribed important numbers to people. They were just numbers. But that's probably more of an indictment of the American educational system in general. <laughs> My basic conclusion is this. A book featuring a Nazi child as the main character, written by a non-Jewish person with little to no historical education in the Holocaust, shouldn't be the centerpiece for Holocaust education. There are many other books out there that can be used to introduce the Holocaust that are far better. There is Mouse, The Diary of Anne Frank, The Devil's Arithmetic. Read essays by people who were children during the Holocaust. You can read Elie Wiesel's Night, plenty of other books. 
There's so many other better books. Even Numbered Stars by Lois Lowry, which Lowry is Jewish, but the main character of the book is, and is a good choice. And sorry if this is incoherent and rambly. That's kind of just how we do things over here. And honestly, I really just need to get this video out. I'm, I know I don't do a lot of solo videos. I, I just have a lot going on in my life and just, in general. But if you want to, comment down below and talk about your experiences learning about the Holocaust in school, whether the boy in the striped pajamas was part of it. What did it make you think about the Holocaust? Did you ever think it was this book was true in any way? And yeah, like, subscribe. Um, I'm gonna try and get more of these videos out. This is already pretty long and I've linked sources down below. Let us know if there's a Jewish topic you'd like us to cover. Thank you so much for watching my incoherent rant and look forward to hearing more incoherent rants about John Boyne in the near future. Bye!